Next up, we'll have Donna Benjamin. She's going to talk turning stories into software, which is a, a, an excellent presentation. Uh, I've seen once before a few years ago, so I can imagine it's only gotten better since then. So welcome, Donna, to the stage. Stories transform us. Stories connect us. Stories make us human. I'm going to talk about turning stories into software. I'm Donna Benjamin. I'm a project lead and business analyst at Catalyst IT. And I'm not so recent anymore, convert to the Agile way. Catalyst IT um, is an open source shop. We just do open source. So if you do PHP and you love open source, then Catalyst is always hiring. So please take a note of that email address and send along your CV and we would love to hear from you. And that is the end of my employer-focused pitch. Let's get on with the show. So that's me. Hello. Hi. Hi. Who are you? Matt Snow. Matt Snow. Hi, Matt. How are you going? So I've done something a little bit um, unfortunate, and I've made some assumptions about who you are. So let me test those assumptions. I can hardly see you because it's proper theatre lights. I have a theatre background, so this is kind of awesome. Um, <laughs> hands up if you consider yourself to be a developer or a programmer or a coder. Okay, that's, that looked like almost 100%, but not quite. Hands up if you consider yourself to be a project manager or a scrum master, or uh, a product owner. Okay, a lot less of you. What about if you're um, a designer rather than a developer? Okay, a few. What about if you're something else in this world that doesn't fit in any of those categories? Awesome. Can I just a couple of people yell out what what you consider where you self to be? What what name do you give yourself? Piano Sorry? I'm a piano teacher. A piano teacher. <laughs> awesome. Another one. Business owner. Business owner. Thank you. I was going to say that, but I, business how, business owners. Few of you. Piano teachers. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Unique. <laughs> Any others? Sorry? Break dancer. Any other break dancers in the room? Ready to come up and... <laughs> no? Later? <laughs> all right. So I'm kind of okay assuming that most, nearly all of you are developers. But hands up those of you who are mainly developers. Work with some of those other types of humans. Yeah, okay, cool. So that's me. That's you. What is a user story? Now, again, bold assumption. Most of you have heard the term user story before, yes? Hands up if this is like alien speak. No one, good, okay. So, what is a user story? So, you're all pretty familiar with this pattern. As a user, I require so I can, or so that, yeah? Familiar? All right. Here's an example. As a goat, I want a per programmer who can help me out. So the work gets done from multiple perspectives. Thank you, goat user stories, for that excellent example. A fluffy tail. Don't you just love the fluffy tail? Very, very perky. All right. So here's the question that I want to ask is where do user stories come from? <coughs> so can I have an, perhaps... Suggestion, where do your user stories come from? You know what user stories are, you use them all the time. Where do they come from? Hell. <laughs> user stories come from hell. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where else do they come from? They come from the user. Anywhere else? Marketing teams. Marketing. 
marketing teams, <laughs> support, teams. support teams, research. research. Ah. <laughs> this is on the track that I want to take us on. Thank you, Anwasha. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> UX teams. Yes. So they come from all sorts of places. So I want to dwell a little bit on where they come from and what that means. So workshops is a good place. One of my favourite places. I love running workshops. And I love this as a place of generating user stories because it's an opportunity to hear different perspectives, test those perspectives, prioritise those perspectives, brainstorm a little bit, you know? So who's, who's worked with user stories that have come out of workshops? A few of you. Who has no idea where their user stories come from? They're just victims of them. <laughs> A few of you. Right. So, moving on. This is another one where user stories come from. Interviews. This is the deep, one-on-one -on -one opportunity, I guess, to really clarify what your user wants. I've got another talk about users and why not like using that word. But one-on-one um, -on -one interview is a real opportunity to get into um, the why behind a user story, to really zero in and ask five whys. So someone said, look, I need to go to a hardware store. And you go, really? Why do you need to go to a hardware store? Because I need to buy a drill. Why? Why do you need to buy a drill? Because I want to drill a hole. Oh, so they don't want to go to a hardware store, they want to drill a hole, but why do they want the hole? They don't want a hole. No one wants a hole. Well, maybe some people do. But generally, you even want a hole to, to, to thread something through or hang a picture or something. So you really keep asking why until you get to that real underlying need. And an interview gives you a really good opportunity to get in deep. But then there's surveys. Because a one-on-one -on -one interview is one data point, really. But a survey gives you an opportunity to validate. It also gives you an opportunity to quantify. So you can get a survey out to a lot more people, it's a lot less intensive, you can refine your questions, you can produce pretty graphs for your stakeholders that make them understand why this is important because 100 people said it was, or why it's not important because no one said it was. So surveys are a really useful way of validating the data that you're gathering, quantifying it. You've got qualitative analysis, qualitative research methods and quantitative research methods. Next one, competitive analysis. Now, I really like this one. It's a bit slow, but it's nice, quiet, desk-based research and you don't have to talk to anyone. Sometimes that can get tiring, right? So, competitive analysis. And this is where you actually just do research on what your competitors are doing. Firstly, identify who your competitors are, where you, where you align with them, what you've got in common, what they're doing differently. Uh, maybe you do a kind of industry-wide kind of comparison about your product and see how people are doing. Now, this is a, this is a really basic, simple um, spreadsheet where I was doing work on a private school website and they were faffing about trying to figure out what their information architecture should be. So I went and found like, I think 20 or something different private school websites and looked at their top level nav and just said, well, what's there? What are people doing? How are they solving this? What's the common patterns? And so, ding, 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 this is what everyone's doing. Ding, 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 these things are different. Oh, here's something interesting. Who's done competitive analysis? Phew. Surprisingly useful. And really good at answering some of those questions where you get stakeholders kind of, you know, at, at odds, because really it's just opinions. But this is a way of saying, well, here's a whole bunch of other people's opinions and how they've solved it. And it lets you have, and here's a key word, a conversation. It lets you go deeper into the story, into the why. And this is absolutely hands down my favourite. And I imagine it might resonate with some of you. The prototype and iterate approach. You have no requirements. The client has no idea what they want. They've sort of said something high level and hand wavy. Yeah? That's the most fun, right? <laughs> Build it. Oh, can you change that bit? Sure. Iterate. Oh, but what about a little bit more to the left? 
Oh, no, 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 actually a bit more. Oh, perfect, thank you, in the middle. <laughs> yeah? Prototype and iterate. I don't have a good photograph for this one. I still need to find. So anyone's got a great GIF or a great image for representing prototyping and iterate, please, please share it with me. But, so we've got all of these amazing user stories, yeah? They've come from these places, workshops, interviews, surveys, prototyping and iterating, some competitive analysis. We've got a great, beautiful backlog of stuff to build. Now what? Who's heard of Invest? Wait, 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 what, what, one? Awesome. One person has heard of Invest. <laughs> Another Mr. Unique. So this is um, just a, a mnemonic, a way of remembering the next five words as a way of thinking about your user stories. But more importantly, about having more conversations about your user stories. Let's start with I, independent. A good user story must be independent. It can't be depend on the one before it or the one after. They should be able to be done in any order. Yeah? Negotiable. You should be able to have a chat about how big it is, where it fits, how important it is, and negotiate the details of it. Negotiable. Valuable. It has to actually deliver value. It has to be real and meaningful and useful and have a payoff. Valuable. Estimable. Now, even if you're a fan of the no estimates movement, you have to be able to figure out how long is it going to take? What kind of skills are we going to need to build it? You have to estimate the effort involved somehow. Hopefully not distilling it down to story points or hours in the day, but really get an understanding of the effort involved. Estimable. Small. Achievable. Bite-sized. Can it be done in your two-week sprint? Can it be done in a morning? What's the right size? Make sure that it's small and achievable within whatever capacity constraints you have. If it's not small, if it's too big, it's not going to be a, um, any of the other things. And finally, testable. Sure, there's the code test, but also is it acceptable to the users that it's meant for? Can you define those tests in advance? Is it testable? Let me go backwards. Testable, small, estimable, valuable, negotiable, independent. Invest. Who's heard of invest now? <laughs> invest in your user stories. Understand them. Don't just see them as this, as a user, I require so I can. There's a lot more under the hood if you invest the time and take an opportunity to build shared understanding with your team. Excuse me while I just have a drink of water, which is over there. Just have a moment of zen. So, invest. Now, I also just want to give credit um, these awesome little cartoons, I did not draw them. Uh, the tiny.cc slash story dash invest, that's where I got them from. I can't remember the person's name who did them, but they're lovely and kudos to them. So, invest. If you want to know more about user stories, this is kind of the original go-to Bible. Who's seen this or read it? A few. Really, if you do want to go deeper into this, this is a really good place to start. There's a bit of a gotcha with user stories. You can lose sight of the big picture. You get in on that tiny little user story. And where does it fit? How does it relate back to the whole? Now, our product owners and our business owners know, but maybe as developers, we're not necessarily sure where it fits. 
how do we maintain um, a view of the big picture? And story mapping is one way to do that. And this book, User Story Mapping by Jeff Patton, also provides lots of clues, practical examples and tips on how to do that. Now, one thing, you can't quite see it, but right at the top of that image, there's some blue sticky notes. What they've done there is draw them back to the, the business's actual strategic objectives. So they're mapping that work against the big picture goals of the organisation as a whole. And everything then tracks under that. So you can see where it fits in the big picture. Story mapping is really useful. Recommend that one. Saw him talk a few years ago at something or other and was a convert instantly. A bit like seeing Simon's talk just before on utility CSS. I'm, I'm converted. But this is, brings us back to our user stories, but how, how do we turn stories into software? Well, here's your key. It's all down to teamwork. And you've got to understand your team to work effectively. And one of the ways of doing that is understanding this thing called group dynamics. Who's heard of Tuckman? I'm just losing today. <laughs> so I hadn't heard of Tuckman until I actually went and figured out where this comes from. The, the theory of group dynamics, which starts with um, no, forming, norming, performing, and storming, and something else, and mourning sometimes when they end. Basically, there's this theory of group dynamics where you come together, you're just a bunch of random humans. But what is it that makes you become a team? Where you care about each other, where you understand each other's skills, you understand each other's strengths and weaknesses, and you work together collectively to achieve a common goal. How do you become a team? Well, there's nearly always a process where that random group of humans kind of you know, gets to know each other a little bit, figures out who's who in the zoo. Maybe it matters what school you went to, maybe it matters which country you came from, maybe it matters which church you go to. There are all sorts of little factors about humans that make us interesting, unique, and give us the opportunity to bring skills and perspectives to the table. So we spend a little time being very polite, nice, friendly, respectful, and, un and beginning to understand that. And then there comes a point where we stop being quite so nice, friendly and respectful and we've begun to build a bit more familiarity. We're maybe build, beginning to build some alliances, you know, this process. Group dynamics, Tuckman, forming, norming, storming, performing, I think that's the right order, is really worth checking out. If you want to kind of get a bit more um, gravity into your understanding of how your team actually works and why it works the way it does. So that's a big tip given none of you knew that. Who, who's actually heard of that now that I've explained it a bit more? A few more of you. Awesome. So Tuckman is the key word there. But the thing about why the teamwork stuff matters and this, use, this concept of user stories comes back to this telling of the stories. We actually have to take that really kind of bland user story on a sticky note back to our teams and have a conversation about it. We need to tell the story behind that story. We need to say, well, where did it come from? Did marketing team just have some kind of crazy workshop with, you know, random humans off the street? Like, where did this come from? What does it mean? Who wants it? Why? What are we building? Where does it fit in the big picture? You've got to have a conversation with your team about it. I can't remember who it was that said, a user story is just a promise about a conversation. The user story is not the thing you're building. It's just a pointer to it. Yeah? So, telling stories in our teams. And why? Oh, I forgot this slide. So the estimating effort part is also part of that telling of the story. Who can do this? Have you done it before? Do you know what's involved? Has no one done it before? Do we have a sense of how long it's going to take? Do we have all the resources we need? All of that comes into that telling of the story and understanding where it came from and why you're doing it. And this is why. Once you have a shared understanding of that user story, of, the, of, of who in the team is going to help make it happen, of why you're doing it and how long it's going to take, does that sound like you're going to be much more successful at delivering that user story than when it was just, you know, three dot points on a card? 
No. Blank stares. Yes? You're yet to be convinced? Okay. Here's another new idea. The habitat. Or in Welsh, Cynevan. This is a big, weird idea, but I love it. And it comes back to that bit about estimating our user stories. And we can think about it in these different ways. Is my pointer clicker going to work? Yes, yes, excellent. So, um, obvious or simple. You're given a, a task or a requirement and it's really crystal clear exactly what's required. You know how to do it. You've probably done it before. You may have done it ten times before. That says nothing about how long it's going to take. You might have done it ten times before and know it takes a month. But it's really simple. You know exactly how to do it. Up from there, complicated. Maybe you haven't done it before but you know other people have. You know there are lots of steps. You know there's a procedure to follow. But you don't know exactly how to do it. No one in your team does. So it's going to require a bit more kind of, you know, effort to get it right. Complex. This is an order of magnitude above that. There may not be established patterns. There might be um, ideas and directions, but you don't necessarily have exactly all the bits and pieces that you need to get there. And, oh, chaotic. Lacking constraint, decoupled, act, sense, respond, novel practice. You might be innovating here. You might be inventing new things here. The rule, there aren't rules. So you are prototype and iterate. That tends to fall in the chaotic. You might be making it up as you go along, but that's okay. And then in the middle, there's something in the middle. So to go over those, obvious, yeah? That sounds, is that something people can kind of relate to? You've seen those sorts of things. Yep, I can do that. Complicated. Complex. Whoa! Whoa. Wow, that was exciting. <laughs> Wasn't obvious that was going to do that. So, where were we? Chaotic. That was chaotic. Come on, round of applause. But the bit in the middle is disorder. <coughs> and we really don't want our projects to be in a state of disorder. But sometimes we work in places that are. And I think there's a really good analogy here. Disorder is, might be um, uh, a disaster zone, like literally stuff's burned down or an earthquake or a tsunami or something. And literally just no one knows what's going on. There are no rules. It's just roll up your sleeves, get shit done, make stuff happen, right? This is valid. And sometimes when we have emergencies in our projects, we slip from one of our lovely, you know, predefined states of obvious, complicated, complex or chaotic into states of disorder. And how we get out of them is what matters. So Kinevan, I think, is a really useful model when you're having those conversations about where are we at. Are we actually like servers down, stuff on fire, we really don't care, let's just get this back up again? Or are we somewhere where we're very carefully, like, you know, defining our... our um, our class names and our methods really, uh, and we have the time and, uh, to do that and we want to get it right. That habitat really matters. That's what Kinevan means, habitat in Welsh. So, what are we building? We've talked about our user stories and where they came from, that our team, we're ready, we're kind of cool. What are we actually building? Let's get practical, let's have some examples. I kind of just thought of three and picked one. So my three were a conference website, like we're all at a conference, right? It has a website. We kind of all know what that is, yeah? Cool, I think that's a safe assumption. But maybe we're building a media library API or some blockchain thing, I don't know. Either way, whatever we're building, there are probably some personas that we want to be thinking about who will be using that thing that we're building. So I went with conference web website. So here's sort of three personas. As a potential delegate. 
I want to know the date of the conference so that I can see if it suits my schedule this year. Yeah? Has the three components. As a future speaker of conference, I want to submit a talk proposal. No? So I might be invited to speak at this conference. That worked out well this time. As a conference organiser, where are you, Michael? I need to review and evaluate talk proposals so we can create a good conference program. Three very distinct personas, which we can drill down into user roles. And anonymous users, our delegate, authenticated users, our speaker, and an admin user our conference organiser. Yeah? It's pretty simple, right? So this is Drupal. Forgive me of my sins if I have trespassed. Um, Drupal 8 comes with those three roles out of the box. That's convenient. Um, and permissions that I can assign at a fairly granular level. Uh, Django, groups and authentication. Like most tools will have something that allows you to do this. In Laravel, you might choose to use a package, you might choose to use core logic. There's going to be some way that you're going to go about doing that. So breaking it down. And again, I come from the Drupal world, so I'm going to use a Drupal example. So you can either forgive me or hate me. That's up to you. <laughs> As a speaker with an accepted talk, I want to share my talk on social media so that people will come to see it. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for coming to see my talk. OK, so from here, let's get some, and here's some more buzzwords, acceptance criteria. So social platform logos should appear on every talk page. Maybe like this? Bit of an example? Is this what we meant? Is this what our user wanted? What about clicking on each logo should pre-populate a post with the URL and session details? Something like this. Okay, sure, that sort of seems to generally meet the requirement. So how do I do that? So in Drupal land, there's like a gazillion different social media thingies that one could use. And fortunately, um, the Drupal Association makes it easy to pick the right module in that case. But in Laravel world, you know, you might be wanting to choose a package. You might be considering whether or not your use case needs, you want to write this from scratch. So find some guide. Drupal Association has done um, this huge, long kind of resource guide on social media in Drupal. So I had a look at that. OK, that gave me some, some ideas. Then I. Um, found an example and went, oh, here's some, here's some that I like the look of. This sort of seems to work the way I kind of want it to. Maybe I can look a little bit under the hood and get some clues. Okay, it says service links. So maybe I'll go and look and see what that is. And Bob's your uncle, Drupal uh, project service links is there. I had a look, I sort of evaluated who made it, how long ago, how many users it has, et cetera, et cetera. And it sort of seems to do the job. So that's where I went. So this is where it all kind of comes together. I've distilled the Agile manifesto down into these four words. People collaborate and the product evolves. The people are us and our team figuring out how to work together, understanding each other, understanding what we're capable of, Understanding the story that we're trying to tell to each other so that we can build useful software. When we have all of those pieces, we can turn that useful software, that product, into something great. And we can work on it together so that it evolves. There's a bunch of references. I'll share the slides later. And that's all I have for you.